Hi, everybody. And Moedim Lasimcha. I'm Stephanie Singer. I am the Director of Arts and Ideas, and on behalf of the JCCSF, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this evening's program, I Could Nosh, with Jake Cohen and Magid Joe Singer. We're so happy to see all of you. Thank you so much for coming out. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that we are gathered here on the unceded ancestral homeland of the Ramatush Ohlone, the original inhabitants of what is now the San Francisco Peninsula. We recognize that we benefit from living, working, and learning on their traditional homeland and affirm their sovereign rights as first peoples. I'd also like to recognize and thank our community partners this evening, including our friends from One Table, uh, Nice Jewish Boys San Francisco, and Value Culture. Um, thank you all uh, for partnering with us and spreading the word and coming tonight. Thank you. Um, I'd also like to thank our bookstore partner, Omnivore Books. The Bay Area's only culinary bookshop. Um, they provided your copies of I Could Nosh. Jake will be signing. Um, he's happy to sign your book in the atrium immediately following the program. And Omnivore will have additional copies of Jake's cookbooks for sale. So be sure to stick around for all of that. After you get your book signed, uh, please take a few moments to check out our new exhibition in the Katz Snyder Gallery on the second floor, Magical Thinking, Superstitions, and Other Persistent Notions, which brings together over 20 contemporary artists to reveal the history, scope, and importance of magical thinking in Judaism. And finally, for those of you want, who want even more food inspo than tonight, allow me to draw your uh, attention to a couple upcoming culinary programs that we think you will enjoy. On Thursday, October 26th, Leah Koenig, author of the new cookbook, Portico, joins Kefiko's chef, David Neifeld, for a conversation about cooking and feasting in Rome's Jewish kitchen. It promises to be a really fascinating and fun evening. And then on January 29th, we've got Sola El Wele and Samin Nosrat for Sola's new book, Start Here. You guys are all the first to hear about that. It's not online yet. Um, and we expect it to sell out really, really quickly uh, once it goes on sale. Um, so I recommend that you sign up for our newsletter so you're the first to hear uh, when tickets go on sale. And you can learn about these and other upcoming arts and ideas events on our website, www.jccsf.org. We are adding new programs all the time. So many of us are still in high holiday eating mode uh, hosting meals for friends and families uh, in their Sukkot. Uh, so we thought it would be fun to bring you some recipes that you can whip together for your festive meals. But you don't need to be Jewish to partake of that, uh, of that most noble of Jewish food traditions. I'm talking about the nosh, both the verb and the noun. Not quite a meal, more than grabbing a bite. Noshing is a vibe. You might nosh on a bagel with a schmear, or pita chips with a hearty dip. Soups, salads, sandwiches, all noshable. According to cookbook author Jake Cohen, a nosh is a snack served up as an act of love, whether the nosher is hungry or not. <laughs> Jake Cohen, a nice Jewish boy hailing from Bayside, Queens, and the New York Times bestselling author of Jewish, is here this evening to talk about his love of modern Jewish cooking, and his latest cookbook, I Could Nosh, Jewish Recipes Revamped for Every Day. Joining Jake on stage is Magid Joe Singer, JCCSF's gifted community Jewish educator and the founder of Queer Core Talmud, a queer normative Sfara method Beit Midrash. Please join me in giving them both a warm welcome to the JCCSF. That works. Yay. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Hi. <laughs> Great to see everybody. Um, I'm super happy to be here with Jake. Um, we got to talk, what, a year and a half ago or something like that. It was really fun. And um, I think we are cut from a lot of the same cloth, albeit mine considerably older than yours. <laughs> um, so 
one of my, whenever I feel, um, you know, that there's an important moment that people have gathered around, um, part of my spiritual practice, whether it's in a secular setting or a, a religious setting or an intellectual setting, is to dedicate my presence or to dedicate my learning. And so I invite any of you to call in um, anybody that you would like to be here spiritually with you. I'm going to call in my friend um, Stuart Crystal DeMann, who passed away very recently. And he was one heck of a chef. And he would have been here for sure, Jake. And I wish he was here so that I could introduce you because I know that would thrill him to no end. Um, so I invite him in. Did you want to invite anybody in? Uh, probably my grandmother. Um, she literally, it's, I mean, I, I, didn't, I didn't tell a lot of people about this story. So she is kind of who this book really kind of began with because she is that like blueprint of hospitality in mm. our family. Um, and I just helped her move right before, like a week before the book came out. She was moving. She lives in Aruba. It's a whole thing. It's like, it's like I don't know what she like. Again, they're very. I come from a family of very impulsive women, and <laughs> and she decided to move to Aruba uh, against everyone in the family's wishes. <laughs> and luckily, she's now relocating to split her time between. She always had her place in Queens still, but to Miami, which is where she belongs in America, <laughs> where we can remotely call her an Uber or hire a task <laughs> rabbit or do anything. Um, so, until, yeah, she hasn't been able to really been able to partake in any of the book stuff until, until I guess, my Miami stop, which will probably be in the winter when I want to go to Miami. Um, what's her name? Annie. Annie. All right. Welcome them all in. Um, so there's something that like really struck me as I was looking at your book. And one of those things is, uh, I'm a gearhead. So I love that you started out with like, here is some gear that you definitely need yeah. in your kitchen. Um, but I had a little question for you about it. Please. Right? Because my experience of you and your, your books um, and your recipes is very like own it. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, okay, knives. Yeah. Do you sharpen your own? Because there was no mention of a knife sharpener in there. And I can tell you for a fact that a dull knife is a very dangerous thing to have in your Correct. kitchen. Correct. Here's the deal. I'm a realist. Bring it. I'm a realist. Bring it. No one's going to sharpen their own knives. Oh, I do. Yes, you, okay. but you are in Now the we have a machlochet going on right really, now. Really, what it needs to be, and there's like, I mean, there was just a thing on Shark Tank of this company where you like, they send you a package, you send out your knives, they send them back sharp, and there are people that will, I mean, this is San Francisco, I'm sure there's some, some person with a little trolley that comes to your house and sharpens <laughs> it on the street. Like, it, it exists in New York, let alone in San Francisco. So there are plenty of ways to sharpen your knives. I think the main issue with that is that sharpening a knife actually requires a bit of skill in a way that the average home cook might not know or might not even want to kind of venture into. So yeah, personally, unfortunately, and this is such a, like, I get sent so many knives that like I never actually have to sharpen them. <laughs> and I just become, I give like, I give the full block and everything is like, is like to someone else. In the, it's a hand-me-downs of like people come by, friend just moved to the city, my sister, all the stuff. They just, they get it. That explains it. Um, great. Thank you. Um, and, and part of the reason I asked that is because I think that there's a beautiful way that you talk about the act of cooking as basically a spiritual act, as a meditative yeah. act. Um, you know, there's a beautiful story in, the, in Chinese philosophy about, um, about somebody who's a butcher who, um, who learns to, to take apart a, an ox without ever needing to sharpen his knife. That he knows, he knows his, the animal so well and he's so in tune with it that he never hits a bone. Mm. And so in a playful way, um, 
looking at how we, how we get close to the food, which you have done so beautifully, both by bringing in your grandmother, your mother-in-law, your friends, um, the people that you, that you um, feed, as well as your Jewish identity, um, and talking about it as a meditation, right? Mm -hmm. Like that when you're cooking for people that you love and care about, or even people that you might love and care about someday, right? When you're guesting people, when you're hosting people, there's a way of, of dropping into it and just getting, you know, becoming one with what you're doing. It sounds a little corny, but we're in California, so yeah, we can yeah, get away yeah. with that. Um, and so I just wanted to, you know, give you the opportunity to talk a little bit about, I mean, what I'm curious about is when was the first time you felt that? Oh, from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. I think that's the difference between myself and a lot of cookbook authors, chefs. Like, for me, I think they're the people that are the, the artists and that are really more focused on the food they're creating. And for me, it's always been more so about food as that vessel for connection. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When I was in high school, I wasn't very popular, and I started throwing these dinner parties and, like, kind of tricking people into being my friend by coming over for dinner. <laughs> I started doing it again as an adult, it worked very well. Um, and something that just, just, it became so unbelievably addictive um, mm -hmm. to create a space in which you get that intimacy, like fast tracked compared to any other type of interaction. I think about like, I don't know, you go on a double date with someone or you go, you like meet up with friends or you go out to dinner and it's these, these really shallow interactions of, of how we like play into this make-believe world that we live in of, of the, just like the motions that we go with. And when you sit down and invite someone into your home mm -hmm. and cook them a meal, you get to know someone so much faster, so much deeper, so much better that I, I kind of I kind of don't want to go back to the, the other thing. Amen. I'll bet all your friends are super happy about that too. Yeah. Yeah. It's a win-win. I was walking with my son once when he was, I don't know, he was maybe 19. Um, he'd gone away to college and... Uh, He'd been away long enough to have like some perspective on where he grew up and who he was becoming. And we're walking along and we, we have long stretches of silence when we walk. And he said, out of nowhere, Dad, cooking is your love language, isn't it? And I was struck. Like, first of all, you know, when you're cooking for your kids, they are seldom very appreciative, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. For, it takes them a little minute to figure out that you actually were trying to love them through that. And to have him say that was such, it was just a moment of all of what you just talked about coming together for me as like, that's why we do it. For sure. Right. For that's sure. why we do it. Yeah. Beautiful. Love that. Um, so I want to get back to kind of your Jewish self. Yeah. And one, I just want to appreciate how um, I think, you know, at least for me, it's really important that you're so out about being Jewish. You're out about being gay also, but, you know, and uh, statistically, there are a lot more gay people than there are Jews. Yeah. Quite a, quite a bit. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. by a huge margin. Yeah. Right? Like, 10% of the world's population is probably solidly, you know, lesbian or gay, and then a certain amount that has variations on that, 0.18% um, of the world's population is Jewish. 0.18. Yeah. So owning that and being proud of it, being excited about it, sharing it out through something tangible and wonderful like cooking, um, you know, it's a great gift. And so I just, I just wanna snap you up for that. Um, and, you know, um, as a Jewish educator um, and somebody who's pretty steeped in uh, Jewish origin stories, this is it. We invented, we invented celebrity chefs. <laughs> we did. We used to call them Kohanim. But their job was to prepare 
and cook and you cook food and feed people with it as an act of devotion or atonement mm -hmm. or um, you know um, gratitude or it was community building that's what yeah. we did so we we invented that as a way of something incredibly immediate and satisfying and you know, sustainable, well, like, or not sustainable, what's the word I'm looking for? Sustaining, right? Mm -hmm. You, you neutrify yourself that way. Um, so it's not surprising to me that, you know, Jews have been in cooking fields in America um, quite prevalently. And, um, you know, I, I'm just interested in how, in your experience of one table and your um, kind of as an adult stepping into your Jewishness with your mm -hmm. hands on it, do you reckon with that, those two parts of yourself, with the cook part and the Jewish part, which obviously do a lot yeah. of it, but I wanted to I hear you talk about it. I think that when it comes to the cooking part, it is so informed by the Jewish part. A, because my reference point from childhood was I, I, I had two working parents. Like we, it was not like we had this Norman Rockwell painting uh, upbringing in the city of like a home cooked meal and everyone's around the table. And it's like mm -hmm. no, it was a lot mm -hmm. of like frozen tabachnik soups and like mm -hmm. whatever and scavenging. And for me, really, the only moments of true dedication to home cooked meals and and like abundance was around the holidays. So. I really kind of resonated with that as these important like checkpoints of when to really extend hospitality. And then past that, when I think of now and like coming into to Shabbat as an adult, which is something that it's a ritual that my husband and I, neither of us really grew up having in our homes. Um, it's because of the fact that like food like Jewish food, and there's like, I don't know, I hate when people are like, oh, I'm culturally Jewish, I love food, food is my, my, my connection to Judaism. And it's like, uh, yes, but um, Jewish food really isn't anything without the ritual it's attached to. Um, and that is a loaded statement to begin with because how you experience, execute that ritual is up to you. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it's, again, about the intention behind it. So just making Jewish food is, like, half of the equation. And the other half is, like, how are you using it? Who are you making it for? What is the intention behind that gathering? And when you look at so many Jewish rituals, it's all rooted in just an intention. Passover, talking about the, the celebrating and, and uh, discussing freedom, Rosh Hashanah, creating reflection for the year behind and intention for the year ahead, Hanukkah and pride and identity and, and all of that, like, like every holiday and down to, to Shabbat of, of pausing, recharging, being present with those you love. Mm -hmm. These are all just intentions. And I think very similarly, when, when I think of One Table, which if you're, if you're unfamiliar, it's this incredible nonprofit that uh, I'm on the board of and it helps Jews in their 20s and 30s create a sustainable Shabbat practice. And for me, what that always meant was that like, you had to make it fit to your life or else you walk away from it. Mm -hmm. And we see that too often. Mm -hmm. And I just think it's so unfortunate because ritual is good for not just us, but like these are just great things to be doing. I think of like yoga as the perfect example I always do. It started as a Hindi practice and now it's become so mainstream because we all realize it's good for you. Of course, it's just one part. And then you add in like the meditation aspect of it and, and it's part of this whole and we choose bits and pieces. And I'm not saying like, okay, you gotta dive into every aspect of Judaism, but when you start to open that door, a lot of good comes from it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, Shabbat, it's probably the most subversive thing, you know, that Jews ever unleashed into the world yeah. of saying, uh-uh, one day for me. Exactly. One day for this body to rest, one day for this body to believe that the world is going to be at peace one day. One day for me to give this body a break from the stress and the toil and the struggle. Yeah. And the, you know, the, the understanding and the integration of food as part of that ritual 
has been with us, like I said, from temple times. Mm -hmm. And when the temple was destroyed and you couldn't do those rituals anymore, the rabbis, I mean, they chucked a lot. You know, there were a lot of things they just threw that out. But not the food. They got a whole Mishnah, you know, written about the blessings you have to say before. And then another Mishnah written about the blessings you have to say after. And um, they kind of did this beautiful move of replacing mm -hmm. the temple ritual with a home-based ritual. Correct. Symbolism. And it's mm -hmm. like the culinary symbolism is so prevalent in all these holidays. And I think there's something so, it's just another like lens of intention when you're thinking about what you're eating through this idea of, well, we're going to eat sweet things because we want to create an intention of, of bringing sweetness into our, our new year, mm -hmm. um, bitter things to make sure that we're reminding ourselves of, of sadness in the past. Like These are really important things that create a visceral reaction um, that when you tie to the fact that you're sharing this experience with those you love, um, it's pretty magical. Yeah. And that's like, and that's, that's just on a holiday level. I think one of the things with this book and that I wanted to do is, is create that for the everyday. When you think of so much of, of Jewish hospitality, when we think of the matriarchs of these families and what they did for, for nourishing those around them, um, it was that. It was with that in mind of how do I feed those I love at all times. Um, and I think too often in the secularization of Jews in America, we've kind of really narrowed down these experiences to just around the holidays. And for me, it's about how do we do this in a sustainable way every day mm -hmm. and create our kitchens as our, our center of hospitality. I have this one friend um, who's a, this comedian, Modi, and he always talks, we always talk about the fact that like whenever we plan a, when we ever set a meeting or doing something, we typically do it at our apartment. And some people think of it as this like power play. But really I just think it's like if I welcome you into my home, it is the best way to get to know you, like see your intentions, get to understand me and, and what, like, it, it's just the best of all situations. I'm just, I'm, I get back tomorrow, it's one of my closest friends' birthdays on Thursday, we're, we're like gonna go out to lunch, and then I was like, actually, you wanna just come over and, and I'll make you whatever you want? Um, and that was literally, like, and it was just, it's, he, he had a much better, he said, he said, yes, of course, because that's, that's a no-brainer. Yeah, yeah, beautiful, right? And that we, that we are bringing our creativity and our love and our skill together when we're, when we're cooking somebody a, a great meal. Yeah. Love that. Um, so, the new book. Yeah. Um, you're focusing on, like, uh, foods that you can make keep for a few days, have available so that you've got a ready to go to. I love the thing that you said about, um, you know, this is, uh, you know, here, eat, eat a little something, eat a little something, and you say, oh, I could, I could nosh, even when go. you really are like, oh, I don't want anything else, right? Um, so uh, tell us a little bit, like, why did you go in this direction after the first book? I'm, I'm curious, like, how you steered here. I always say that like cookbooks are very similar to like fashion collections where it's just like kind of the, it's like of the season of what I'm obsessed with. Uh -huh. And I think <laughs> this was kind of a reflection of the past two years coming out of the pandemic and, and there was this big push back towards after being starved of, of interaction for so long of really creating as many opportunities as we, we could to be with family, be with friends. Um, welcome people into our home. It's also the, kind of the first time as we moved into uh, an apartment that was big enough to really host oh, regularly. Good for you. Um, yeah. So all of a sudden, it just it became a regular part of our routine, and this is an extension of that. This mm -hmm. is these are I always say these are all recipes, and it's, it's why when you look at like many of the cookbooks, they always have these like little dinky head notes of like, all right, this is yummy. And you can switch out 
cauliflower instead of whatever. And I give these kind of fleshed out anecdotes of, of the origin story of every recipe and, and how it's tied to family or tradition or how it was done with friends. So, so much of, of, like every time I'm doing like an interview about the book, I was just doing one, one today this afternoon and they like bring up a recipe. I was like, oh yeah, well that was, I was going to this person's house for Shabbat and I needed to bring something and I was in LA. So that we're talking about the, the, I have these crispy Persian rice treats which are inspired by Tadig, which is the crispy Persian rice. And I was like, oh, what if we did like a dessert version mm-hmm. that like flavored mm-hmm. it with, with saffron and then added in barberries and chopped pistachios. And, and I think, and it was because I was in LA. It sounds so really good. It's very good, and it's very simple, and it's both nostalgic and yet elevated, and kids love it, and adults love it. Um, and it's, it's just these things happen, and I love to share the story because it's, it's, it's how, it doesn't, nothing ever comes from thin air. It's that uh, yeah. something, like it begins as something, and then my husband will say something, what if we took it in this direction, or then I'll be out and I'll try something, and it'll just like hit me, I'm like, oh, this can, meld with that and and that's how the book comes about from like two years of just experimenting and playing with food i love that and um and you you say something in like the beginning you've got some great stuff in the beginning um you've got this like 10 point uh, kind of walk through your 10 commandments as it were um and the last one you say 10 but nothing really matters nothing really matters right but People take themselves like way too seriously. Have though. fun with it, yes. right? Right? Yeah. That's the way I read it too. But it made me think of this teaching um, from uh, Simcha Bunim, this 18th century Hasidic uh, teacher, which very famously he said, everybody should walk around with a slip of paper in one pocket that says, nothing matters. <laughs> right? Like, I don't matter. And in the other pocket, you should have a slip of paper that says, everything matters. I matter a lot. And I think that, in fact, that's what you're saying. Completely. Yeah. And that just showing up, right, and saying, I'm going to try to cook for this person. I'm going to try to love them up through this thing that I can do and that I've, you know, learned to do and that um, is an essential human need. Yeah. Um, It really matters. Yeah. And uh, if you put in a little too much yogurt, right? You, do, you ran out of something, right? To, to walk that walk between like, okay, it's not perfect, but it doesn't mean you don't put it on the table anyway, right? Completely. Yeah. I and think too often we, we don't treat cooking like it really is. So it's like we, we, we go to the gym or it's like, we're like oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start running and then the next week you won't be like, all right, I'm running the marathon. No, there's like an, there's an, there, there's a, 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 an incline to, to the journey. So I mean, it's like, oh, I, I'm five days into Duolingo. I am not going to be fluent. Like th- this is really <laughs> just as much of a discipline as all those other things. We just treat it differently. We treat it as if it's something that should just be plug, plug and play. Yeah. And I find that we just create all this extra stress. Oh my God, anytime they're hosting, people freak out or they say they're not a good cook. Anyone can cook. It's very like ratatouille. It's like, it's not that, this is not that deep. Like every, it's just everyone takes themselves too seriously or they're too much of, they, they just get into their own way. Mm-hmm. And I just like, I don't know, I'm not, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna encourage that. And I feel like a lot of cookbook authors or food people come from this place of, of talking at people like they are this, this expert and you have to aspire to be like them versus we're all in this together. This is just how I do it to help mm-hmm. you step up your cooking game. Um, so yeah, nothing really matters because it's, it's just food. It's just food. If it really goes bad, like plenty of times, even just Friday, I was, I cooked this Shabbat for my friend Benny in LA and Everything came out amazing except for one thing and I ended up not, I just didn't serve it because I didn't, I forgot to buy something from the store so I tried to swap something because I pivot and that's what you got to do and sometimes the pivot works and it's amazing and it becomes the new iteration of a recipe that goes into the next book and sometimes it doesn't work and, and guess what? Life goes on. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. Right, and then the, the Bunim teaching is that on those moments when you're feeling a little too, like, 
oh, I'm so, uh, you know, I'm the, I'm the reason that the entire world was created. You pull the other one out of your pocket that says, there you eh, go. no, <laughs> not actually. That's so, the thing about a meal. There's right. There's always another There's one. There's always in a few another hours, one. Like... Probably in a few hours. <laughs> I love that. Um, <laughs> sweet. And, and I mean, I, I was kind of feeling that vibe with this book, too, which is um, when we think of noshing as like, you know, like uh, noshing is just not as, doesn't have that same gravitas and that same like production number of putting on a big fancy meal, but it's still eating and it's still nourishing yourself and it's still an important part of our, of our you know, human needs. Um, so I kind of love that you put together a book that's got like, you know, recipes for creating things upon which you will later not just feast, but will nosh. Yeah. And that idea of like, you know, again, the, the same son of ours, he is the nosher extraordinaire, this kid. And uh, he'll eat, and then you'll see him about an hour later, and he'll come up and he's just little, little bits. That's so it. whenever he's at our house, I just leave the food out. God. I just leave it out, right? And there's something so inviting about that. And I feel like that's a lot of the book is that invitation. Just leave the food out. Completely. Yeah, yeah. So great. Um, all right. Here's, here's like a little like fanboy moment. Okay. Yeah, okay. I wrote my thesis on Manischewitz wine. Yes, we love. I really did. We love. I got a master's degree. I am one of the world's, I am the world's leading authority on Manischewitz wine, as a matter of fact. Love. And you love it. Yes. 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 All right. And you've got recipes that have Manischewitz wine in it. And I do. I'm super happy to see that. Thank so you so I, much. Yeah. So anybody, I, anybody else, you want to love him up for that? Like yeah, that's, we love, that's a thing, we love right? Yeah. right? So here's the deal. I don't drink. Um, my husband doesn't drink. But we do love Manischewitz. Why? Because it's like grape juice. It's sweet. It's delicious. I'm a big believer. It's like wine doesn't taste good. That's like my hot take. It's like it's not good. It's like like I'll take a like a Diet Coke any day over a glass of wine. <laughs> and Manischewitz is kind of like that beautiful bridge in between. Um, <laughs> that being said, other than a little sip, it's it, like when we had this like big gay Jewish house on Fire Island this summer, and that was the thing is we we keep this one bottle of Manischewitz, and we could leave it. On even like the, the weeks that we're not there because no one's going to touch it. Um, so it would just be there. Um, and I, I, so I, I thought of like what could I do that really kind of plays on it. I also love Concord Grape. I think it's just such an incredible, vibrant flavor and, and real like taste of like my part of America. Um, when you mm -hmm. think of, of that part of the country, like Concord Grape is such a fall staple. So I wanted to do kind of a play on a fruitcake, but with a ton of dried fruit reconstituted in Manischewitz and then have that be the base of like a really, like an orange scented uh, cake batter. And then you bake it in a bun and then you use a little more Manischewitz to make it this gorgeous pink glaze and you drizzle it on top and it's both like, it's just kind of perfect. It's really, it's really dense and decadent um, and perfect for Sukkot. Um, <laughs> And yeah, I, 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 love, I love those kinds of recipes, things that are, are really thoughtful, that seem like they don't make sense, but then you dive in a little deeper and you're like, oh yeah, no, that's, that's exactly what it should be. Like what would happen if like a Jew was making Christmas cake? And it's like, oh well, instead of rum, obviously we'd use Manischewitz. That's right. Um, when I was working on my thesis, a friend of mine, and I was like accruing all things Manischewitz, wine. The whole situation, because Manischewitz, the Manischewitz Food Company never made Manischewitz wine. It was a license. Well, I know there's still. I know that's still. There's still. I mean, I work. I work a lot. I mean, I, we had to get approved for even that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I'm familiar. So it's a sitch, and so I was really interested in how they um, man why they why they wanted the name Manischewitz and how they marketed it and and what was the um, what was the drive behind it. So I was like eBaying constantly, you know, getting old Manischewitz bottles and, and I'm like studying the labels very, very closely to see 
where they were making it, who was involved, and blah, blah, blah. So I was pretty obsessed and driving all my friends pretty crazy with it because who wants to hear about managed? I was like almost nobody. Um, and a friend gave me this recipe from the Dominican Republic um, for black cake, which is a, mm -hmm. a, a celebratory cake that you find throughout the uh, Caribbean islands. Mm -hmm. Um, that was made with manischewitz. Really? Yeah. So I and and it's a six month process. Yeah, of course. Um, and uh, and so I made I made that, and I I, I could see resonances. Yes, like that's exactly. A, literally, that's exact. There is huge huge influence on that. That was something I was uh, I'm doing a lot of travel throughout the Caribbean, and that's a very common thing in their version of Christmas cake. They start. Literally, as soon as the holidays are over, they get their jar, they fill it with dried fruit, typically, or like a lot of times it'll be, be like candy cherries, and, and they cover it with rum and they just keep it going all year round. Yep. Um, it's often a wedding present that you give to someone. Yep. Um, and I just, I, I love that. I think there's something so, so fascinating about that, especially when we already have this this bottle that is so ingrained in mainly just our community. Yeah. Um, so it kind of seems like a little bit like just for us. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, pretty much nobody else wants it, but... There you go. There you go. <laughs> we love. I mean, yeah. Folks from the Caribbean and Jews. Uh, pretty much all about it. Um, yeah, so I loved seeing that. And you also have got a, a, a rum, rum Manischewitz punch in, the in first there, book. which is, yeah. was uh, also just kind of lit me up a little bit. Um, also, um, I love that you, okay, so I don't know if this was intentional, but you don't have a straight up honey cake in either book. Cor uh, I what? What? Yeah. What? Uh, what? Uh, huh? <laughs> You've got a honey apple cake. But I looked, I couldn't find just a straight I up do. honey. It's a caramelized honey bundt cake in this one. Really? Um, it's very good. I missed it. It's very good, and it's parv. Um, and I think it's one of those things, I, I, I do love the playfulness of like the first one. This one, the apple and honey snack and cake in this one is kind of a response from my first one, which was the apple upside down honey mm -hmm. cake, which is very ornate and people make it and I love it. Um, but I also wanted to give, I think one of the big things about this book is that there are like levels to the recipes where it really just goes across the full, full gambit of, of like super easy beginner to more complicated project. And really what I want to do is create these opportunities for people to kind of like get hooked in mm -hmm. and do something and that comes out so well that they're like, oh, actually, I can handle something more complicated and then let them continue on that journey. So that's always the best when, when people, because all they really need is like the confidence of a recipe coming out well and the rest is history. Yeah. Well, we're, we are decidedly, I mean, since we're in this time of year, our family is definitely on the apple cake side apple of cake things. Side. The honey Love. cake, we're not so good on it. So I was looking and wondering, is this like, it looked like you were doing a really good job of straddling the... Uh, Both. The, the, yeah, yeah. With, with that. So uh, we'll have to give it a try yes. and see if we can like make a little room for honey in, uh, in our um, holiday cooking next year. Um, sweet. Well, I'm like, you know, we got a lot of people here who probably want to be asking some questions. Yeah. Let's do Are it. Are there? Should we, should we open it up? Are you ready for that? Yeah, Good definitely. Good to go. Do you have any questions for me? No, I'm kidding. Just, um, I always yeah. say, it's so funny. So the last two events I've done have been, um, I was just in LA. I was with my friend Alex Edelman, the comedian, and he always opens the question portion. And I love this. He's like, okay, here are the ground rules. Thank you. I don't need any compliments on how much you love a recipe. I don't need Jewish geography right now. Save that for the line. Um, and I think that was it. I can't remember the other things. But those two things we'll put to the side for later when it's one-on-one. -on -one. And a question ends with a question mark. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Hi. Hi, Jake. Thanks for being here. Hi. Um, what has been, as you, as your fame and popularity has grown, what's been the response from celebrities, audiences, just about how proud and open Jewishly 
you are? Have, have you, like, what's the response been? I think it's kind of this mirroring of them playing around. We, we have created this kind of like wildly famous Shabbat group. Mm -hmm. um, and it continues to grow, like like all these rant, like I got a message from from the the people who like get the book and then like cook from it and go crazy. Like I just got a message from David Schwimmer this morning that he just got the book and he's, he's so excited to start making it with his with his son. Like and you you you, you becomes this kind of or this is the real this is the real thing. Oh my god, it was it was crazy. I get this I I I I got this video from. Uh, Busy Phillips. She asked. She was like, "Oh, can I need I need a couple of signed copies before it came out." And she sends me this video, and it's her with Michelle Williams going through the book because they're they're, they're both. I mean, Busy was married to a Jew. Michelle's married to a Jew, and it's this idea of of creating mm -hmm. um, this real kind of affinity for Jewish food, Jewish culture, Shabbat, um, in a way that is also like. It's just so much fun. They love it. It's so intimate. It's so it's so amazing. It's so the antithesis of celeb culture, of the sceny world we live in, of red carpets and ugh, I hate it. I hate it. Thank you. Next question up here. Thank you. What is your process in determining which recipes actually make it into the book? That's a great one. Um, I start with like a Google sheet where I start throwing out ideas and I, then I really let it kind of go from there. A lot of it is, is, and it's funny because I surround myself, I don't surround myself with many food people. I love creatives and other verticals. And I see all my comedian friends do it all the time where it's just like there'll be moments in life and something comes to you and you open up your notes app and you have like, I have an ongoing list of things, ideas. Sometimes it's just like these Sometimes I don't even, I, like it's gibberish. I have no idea what I was thinking. Um, but it just becomes this, this never ending list of, of thoughts that come into my head of what if I did this with that? And sometimes my husband, will, my husband's my muse, truly, truly, truly. And he'll just like say, like, what if you did blank with blank? Or what if you, you just said, like, oh, you should do a recipe with an ingredient. He just literally will just sometimes say an ingredient, but he always happens to say it at the perfect right time when I'm like working on something. Um, so there's no like one way uh, because the other part of like this book and so much of, I, of what I do is I love the preservation element of I, I took a ton mm -hmm. of recipes from my great grandmother because I have a recipe box, ton of recipes from my, my husband's family um, and just made them, tweaked them, saw how they were, would kind of be like really sustainable in, in um, the 2023 table. Um, so a little bit of everything. Hi, do you have a favorite go-to menu that you make when you really just need to hit it out of the park and you're not gonna experiment? That's a great question. Um, I have a couple. Uh, many, most of them, most of the, them are really in this book. Um, I'll say the soupless chicken soup. It is the, it is my go-to. It is my go-to to impress anyone. And I, I just made it Friday, and it's one of those recipes where it's one pan if you're serving just like four or five people. But like when I do it for a crowd, it's just as easy. I par roast the vegetables. Um, and then I sear all the chicken and I just assemble it on a sheet pan and throw it in the oven. So it works just as well when you scale it up. Um, and then I would say for dessert, the Simmons cake has kind of become like my back pocket because it's like good, all, like everyone loves carrot cake all year round. Um, and yet it's, it's just foolproof. Everyone who makes it, I, the number of people that message me, like it's the best cake I've ever made, and that's the goal. The goal is for people to just like have something that's that's foolproof. Next question here. Hi Jake, thank you so much for being here. Um, I first fell in love with cooking over during the pandemic when I was watching your Instagram videos, and since then I'm now a student in law school, and I found that. In the last few years, I've completely stopped cooking, and I really miss it because it brought me so much joy. So I was wondering if you have any advice for how to slowly reintegrate cooking, um, especially noshing, um, because sometimes that's all we have time for. Thank you. Yeah, I think, I think it's so 
it, it, it's such a that's that's such a response that I think can be parallel to so many things. Um, I see this as an act of like both self care um, and just like an important skill in the same way of people prioritizing the gym. And I think too often it's like, oh, I don't have time. It's like the the other side of that is like, no, no, no you don't make time. Um, so there is a big difference between saying, oh, I'm going to take on this ridiculously labor-intensive project versus these are the things that I'm going to do to cook a little. These are the things, like a big thing that I see all the time is like on TikTok and everyone always asks me, it's like, oh, do you love Trader Joe's? I don't shop at Trader Joe's because it's all like frozen. It's, all, it's like, it's Sandra Lee semi-homemade where it's just like you're taking a bunch of pre-made <laughs> things and cooking them together. But that being said, that being said, it's like this is also, this is also the company that has made Dates Ceylon available, Date Syrup available nationwide now and, and, and is popularizing Amba, the incredible Iraqi Jewish condiment. So it's finding like what are the shortcuts that you can do that make work for your schedule? And if that means that you're, like, I don't know, making one aspect of your meal and the rest is kind of supplemented by pre-made store-bought, like, Dainu, that's enough. Yeah. 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 Um, so, uh, as somebody who is now lactose intolerant, as I'm sure many Jews are, I miss a lot of the recipes that had, you know, a shit ton of dairy growing up. Yeah. So I'm wondering if there's any recipes you have in the cookbook or that you recommend you've been able to like sub out dairy and it's still like just as good and just as nostalgic completely i feel like i did so many par of desserts in this right in this book and so many incredible swaps that you can do to make a dessert parv i think it's also just level setting with yourself i think one of the things that comes up all the time is i'll post like a recipe for something and I'm be like oh how, how do i make this parv and i'll be like tiramisu like <laughs> No, unfortunately, that's just like it, it's a that's a hard path. It, it, there is there is like there is a limit. Um, so I, I think there is both the opportunity to dive into the incredible world of baking with olive oil, which is one of my favorite things. Most of the cake you'll see in this book use olive oil. I just love it because it's like it has a bit of acidity, which reacts really well with the, the leaveners. Um, but also, it's just like. Uh, I think Jews are one of those people where, where I always say it's like you, can, the Jew, you have three options: you can choose who choose alcohol, choose who choose dairy, choose who choose spice, and you only get one. Um, <laughs> so for me, I've always been a Jew that chose dairy. Um, yeah, I, I think there, there are a lot of options in this book that I get to play with it. I think dairy is an incredible, incredible group of ingredients that enhance dishes, and there are moments where it's. There's no world in which you can swap it, and then there are plenty of opportunities, or it's just not necessary. Thank you. Right here in front. Hi, Joelle. I actually uh, flew down here, uh, up here from Orange County. Oh. But I just wanted to um, ask you first of all, you are so enthusiastic, and I have a 16 year old daughter, and she's very proud to be Jewish thanks to people like you. And I just want to say thank you. But this open t one table. One table. Oh, I'm so sorry. No, One no table. My daughter had like a club rush at her school last week. And, and I mean, this is no disrespect to anyone, but she said there were five Christian groups. And I was wondering, do you think the one table would be something that like teenagers could use at their school? Because she really wants other people to, to own their Judaism. And I feel like maybe like there's like a, they're in hiding like they don't want to be like seen do you have yeah. any suggestions i mean so the one thing is like one table is for like post graduating college and the whole idea is like this is when people are truly on their own um and starting to build their own community versus at that moment really it's uh, judaism is so focused in the home unit and so focused in the community that's built around the JCC, the congregation you're a part of, all of that. Um, and really, that's, that's within the community itself. If anything, that should be like how the, the congregations create youth groups. Like affinity groups should exist in all schools. And yeah, there's always going to be a lot more Christian ones just because they outnumber us like crazy. Um, so yeah, but I, I think even... Yeah, so one, it truly is, it's when, like, you are in your 20s and 30s, it's the whole idea is post-college, pre-family, um, pre-children, and 
It's creating both a platform because it's the technology to create dinners, invite all your friends, very easily set up an invite, much like a paperless post for Shabbat. Um, down to the details on like, all right, is it kosher? Do, I need, do you need to bring anything? Everything around that. We offer all of the resources on, all right, I'm gonna host Shabbat. Am I saying the prayers? Am I saying them in Hebrew? Am I saying them in English? Am I doing a meditation that is representative of what these rituals represent? Um, and then past that, we then provide nourishment through the form of helping financially support the dinner, whether that be partially paying for your groceries, paying if you need a table, paying for takeout, paying for cookbooks. You can get my book. You can get Adina's books. You can get any, anything that you need that helps make Shabbat more sustainable. They help. And the whole idea is, is you could both be a private one that you just create and invite your friends as well as there are open ones in which you can find Shabbats in your neighborhood. You just move to a city. You want to find Jewish community. This is how you do it. And I think that's incredible and important. Um, yeah, yeah. So it exists in San Francisco. But again, this is like, this is Jewish philanthropy. This is this world. I'm very lucky that one of my closest family friends, who was my grandmother's best friend, pretty much single-handedly made it possible in the Bay Area. Um, and that is really what, well, that's, that's the whole point. It's, it's the, this community of people that are going to do whatever it takes to keep, mm. keep us going. Uh -huh. Thanks so much for being here. Um, I'm very familiar with One Table and involved in a variety of other more ritualistic practices around Judaism um, and think the food and the history of food and the things we've talked about tonight as a part of our culture are so significant. Um, but I'm wondering what other things you're seeing as you're going around the country and promoting the book and involved in so many food scenes and Jewish scenes that are um, happening um, that we should know about that can be mimicked here in San Francisco. I think where a community that's looking for sort of non-traditional Jewish practices and certainly have a big culinary scene, um, if there are other things that you can share with us that you're seeing that are cropping up in that space. Yeah, I mean, I think that's so funny. We were just talking about this before we started about one of my favorite temples. I, know I don't have like a, I'm not part of a specific congregation, but there are a couple in the city that I, I go to for either the high holidays or, or for, for services. And um, it's Temple Emanuel, which is where the Striker Center's out of, and they started this thing called Friday Night Hub, which is not like it's not every month. Maybe it's every other month. It's a couple of times a year, and they reserve Friday night services just for people in their 20s and 30s. And instead of a traditional service, it is all of the prayers of Friday Night Shul reimagined and rewritten. Um, musically by David Broza, the Israeli like rock star, um, with a full orchestra behind him, and there's a light show, and it's kind of like, I always say it's like it's a little bit like um, like a mega church, but for Judaism, <laughs> um, and you experience it, and you're just like, okay, these people might have been onto something, because uh, it's really really fun. Um, so there's stuff like that, and then and then past that, I think the real thing are are the the individual people that are kind of pushing Jewish food to the, the forefront of making, making Judaism popular. It really, it's all about subliminal Judaism. As we gotta just like sell it. It's like what Mike Salmanov did with Israeli food. We're really seeing that right now with Ashkenazi food across America and that's what we need to keep going. Next one, right here on your right, left. Hi, thanks, Jake. Um, uh -huh. One of the things, you just mentioned Ashkenazi food, and one of the things I love about your work is that you, you do so much wonderful Ashkenazi food and Ashkenazi-inspired food, but you also show the diversity and the richness of the diaspora beyond just yeah. bagels and lox and all of that. Um, and I'm curious, I think that's important even for those of us who are Jewish and you know people who know a lot of Jews, but I'm curious, if you had somebody coming in totally fresh, knew nothing about Judaism, nothing about Jewish food, culture, anything. If you could choose one recipe from your books that would be like, this is my Jewish identity. This, this dish is what Judaism is for me. What would it be? Oh, that's a great question. Um, it's challah, very easily, very, very easily. And, and the reason is, is that first off, it's rooted in such ritual and tradition. And then B, it's such an extension of 
why we make Jewish food. Um, really, it's the, the intention around creating, baking fresh bread for someone is so intimate. It's like truly, it's something that takes so long. It's something that, we're, it's a living, breathing thing that you have to respect. Mm -hmm. um, and the intention behind it of, of, it serves on the table as this vessel of what makes it, what transfers a gathering into a meal, into something that really has an intention around connection. So that's gonna look different for every, everyone's answer is gonna look different, but for me, it's hal. Okay. Hi. Hi. Um, so it's often said that folks eat with their eyes. Mm. <laughs> um, and between your books, as well as like all of your Instagram posts, like there's so much beautiful creativity to how you present food. So yeah. I'd love to know a little bit about like, what is your philosophy behind how and why you, you choose to show off your, your amazing food the way you do? Yeah, it's, uh, literally, that's, it's so important. I think one of the reasons is on just like a high level, mission-wise, it's like being good for the Jews and helping push Jewish food mm -hmm. into mainstream culinary canon. And one of the main inhibitors of that in the past is that it was just not given the resources, the funding. Um, so cookbook shoots, when you would look at the Jewish cookbook, most of the recipes wouldn't have, have images, it would be a little dated, it just, it, it just wasn't given kind of the, the same quality as a lot of the flashier titles that, that come out. So really, the only answer is you throw money at the problem. And um, I, I spent honestly double the amount on the photo shoot for this book than the first one. And it shows, it's something that I really wanted a book that was stunning, that people are going to open up and they're gonna see like, wow, this is Jewish food, past the fact that like, wow, I wanna make this recipe. Cause that's like core, core level is they open it up, I wanna make this recipe, I wanna cook. Pat, push them past that threshold of it sounds good into I need to make this. And a lot of times you need that visual help to, to do that. Um, and then secondary because it's, it's part of the subliminal Judaism machine that I'm, I'm a, a proud member of. Next one on your left. Hi, Joe, hi, Jake. Um, this is a follow-up to that actually. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned before, you know, growing up with a mom, you know, throwing it together as best she could, maybe outside of the holidays on a regular day to day. It's, it's soup, whatever. I relate to that too. You know, it's fish sticks, it's whatever. And I wondered if you saw yourself as part of sort of a journey, you know, the uh, abundant Jewish cooking in the 50s, 60s, right? Yeah. And I think a lot of us kind of harken back to that. Maybe we have a grandmother that cooked at that. Completely. And then there was a generation that stopped they, to like, you know, low fat and fast American tricks and that. Do you feel like you're part of a kind of a movement or a resurgence of let's host, let's have abundance, let's use actual foods and not processed food? Like, is it an intentional thing on your part and something you're trying to help folks like us who maybe don't host a lot or didn't have a big cooking learning experience growing up to like get us in there? Just wondered yeah. where you saw yourself on that continuum. Yeah, I think. It's funny, the way I see it in the, the 50s, 60s, like the way the pendulum has swung back and forth is, is even less about the abundance and like the health food or the diet food. Um, and it's more so about like this, I think that this demonization on homemaking. Uh, and I think we see like, like, I don't know, it's like girl boss culture. It's like, it's about the career. It's about having it all. And having it all did never involved the home. Having it all meant having the family, having the career, having, I don't know, the vacation home, but it never involved hosting people. Um, and for me, I found that that was like, that's like a hole missing from people's lives. It's such a huge part of, of, of our existence is that connection with others. And this is the way to have it most authentically. Um, in a way that we've like, my husband and I really have put even intention, the main thing that we've been trying to change is like vacation with friends. Like what we did this summer of like, fi like we, our fire officer was five weeks living with him. When I think of how long it takes when you like have someone you like and you get them on the calendar, maybe if you're lucky, like every other month for dinner and you count those hours, it's nothing. 
You get, you get more time mm-hmm. with someone spending one weekend with them than you do in, in just like constantly trying to see them out. So by creating intention around the home and bringing people in and making that sustainable, you're just really doubling down on connection and building community um, in a way that I find, I don't know, I, I've always said like, I signed up to be a housewife and like all of this just happened. Um, <laughs> And that's, that's not false. I mean, it is false because this was always part of the plan. But I, I really do love being a housewife. Great. We're going to take two more questions. Uh, I just want to remind everybody that Jake is going to be signing immediately after. Um, and I also have a surprise for all of you. We, our, our friend Lisa Kirby, who is not here tonight but is a home chef, has prepared several of Jake's cookies from the cookbook including the Rice Krispie Treats, and they're out there for you to enjoy and uh, experience, taste, and, 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 yeah. Love. Yeah. And nosh, exactly. Thank you. Hi. Um, speaking of your path, you brought it up. It's awesome that you've kind of paved this really niche place in social media for yourself and, like, made being Jewish hip and through food... Um, can you talk a little bit about like your path and how you, like did you find that it happened really fast through social media to cookbooks? Like, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, it's always the joke where it's like, oh, he, an, uh, an overnight success 10 years in the making. Um, <laughs> because that's how it, it always seems from the, the outside. The fact was, it's like I immediately went from high school to culinary school, then worked in restaurants and knew very early on that this just wasn't the path I wanted. I always had this obsession with media. I always knew that's where I wanted to be. So I, a lot of it's just timing. I started out in test kitchens back while print magazines were still kind of at their height. Um, well, really at, at their decline. And <laughs> so getting to have that kind of experience of what went into the production of a monthly magazine um, I started at Sever and then I, I then quickly moved on to, to digital and it was tasting table back at like when it was like email newsletters were the hottest thing and everyone was, was reading that and that's how they were getting all of their culinary content. Um, and throughout the entire process, I always knew social was important. So I prioritized that for myself. I knew I wanted to be building up my own channel. Um, and I was always having to create content and, and things for everyone else, um, but it had to also like be beneficial for me. Perfect example when I was at Tasting Table is when like Facebook Live was invented and it launched. And literally one day our social editor just came in, just like, there's this new product, We're, you're live now to, to a million people, go, cook. Um, and I started, ended up doing like one almost every day and it's the reason that I can do live TV shows, that I can like just hop into anything and just talk because a pra- practice. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because you don't feel nervous because it's just practice. Because like the first time I did it, I remember the CEO. I hate him. Uh, we're not um, good times. But he literally, he just, he was just ripping me apart <laughs> that I was terrible on camera uh, because I was because it's very much like cooking or anything else. It's it's a journey. Um, so building up social was quite easy. I think I, I have a good understanding of, of, of how the platform works. I think the number one thing that people hate to believe, and it's, it's just like, you got to be yourself, and you either work or you don't. And the way I always explain it is like, look at reality television and like the housewives you love or people on Survivor or anything that you digest. It's very simple. There are people that you love, people that you love to hate, and um, people that you just hate. And really, it's just like, it, it, it's, it, it's how it is. It's no different than the people around you in life. <laughs> mm. We're going to take one last question. Oh, and this isn't a question so much as oh. a suggestion or oh. idea. Something like one table for seniors. Oh, wow, funny you should say that because we have launched something called One Table Plus in which we are um, popping up in different communities doing just that for supporting that. It, again, we have our core mission, but this is a community that still needs to be served, so I, I'm unsure which 
individual hubs that we're, we're starting with, but that's the goal is to create that kind of space for anyone who needs connection. Mm. <laughs> wow, Jake, thank you. Right. Um, I'm so sorry that you're not getting to spend a little bit more time here I and um, to be able to enjoy a little bit of the city. Um, I've had all of one protein shake in San Francisco. Yeah, that's not what's happening here. Um, Thank you so much um, for everything that you're doing. And we, we just barely scratched the surface. There's so much to talk about um, in terms of the kind of culture building that you're a part of, the kind of um, you know raising up of Judaism that you're a part of, the kind of invitation in that you're a part of and that you're supporting. And um, may, it, may it just continue for you, you know? Just keep doing it, keep doing it, right? Totally. Um, and um, yeah, I can't wait to try that uh, apple honey cake. I'm going to get go. on that. Yeah, I'm going to get on that. And I'm going to look for that honey cake with the caramel uh, drip on there. That sounds like it, like it might be an inroad for our family. Perfect. Yeah. Thank it. you so much. All right, I'll see you all outside. <laughs>